But in the meantime, let's hold them high, shall we? I believe this is the perfect word of God. It's about my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. I desire only to, to know it, the power of God's Holy Spirit. Live it, amen, through the power of God's Holy Spirit, amen? amen. Romans chapter 9, as we continue to walk through God's word. So, Father, we ask you to bless your word, and we thank you so much for it. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come through these doors. We are broken. We desire to hear from you. We thank you, Lord, that we can have that confidence in knowing that you, Holy Spirit, will teach us today. And so we move forth with great joy and further understanding after this day. And in advance, we say thank you for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray and say... Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 9. Now, previously, as we've been in the book of Romans for several months now, in his writing of the book to the Romans, we've come to understand that the Apostle Paul has been writing to the Gentile church. We get that. Furthermore, in the previous chapters, the Apostle has made it obvious to us that the Lord saves by grace. There's no other way. It's grace, right? That's how the Lord saves. Grace, just quite simply defined, undeserved favor. We don't deserve it. And therein lies the reality of God gives you and I undeserved favor no matter what. And so when we kind of think about it, we can quickly understand that human beings could not invent God. It would be impossible. We see the little gods that we invent, don't we? And I like the idea that we take a bar of soap and whittle out a little, a little god and then as we use that little God, all of a sudden he disappears, right? That's as good as we get as human beings. We, can't, we cannot create God. There's no way we could give undeserved favor to anybody in our lives. I mean, let alone for one day, let alone a week, and forget about a month, we're already out of the picture. And so I'm totally convinced the more we learn about grace, the more we understand and recognize human beings could not invent God. It's impossible. We just invent these little things that are worthless. These little things out of stone or out of silver or gold or whatever. It's impossible for the human mind to create God. Therefore, I know he's real. Because he says, and he's been teaching us through his word, that you come to me by grace, not by your works. And man, that's foreign to our thinking, isn't it? Well, what do I come with? What do I bring? So you don't bring anything. You come and receive. And again, that is just absolutely foreign to our thinking. Impossible to invent God. Impossible. He always was, is, and will be. And that's a joy. That gives us real peace. So undeserved favor, grace, offered by God himself. And because it's God's grace... We must receive his grace through his provision. Make sense? Since it's his, he tells us how to receive. Well, his provision, the finished work of Jesus Christ. We're becoming very comfortable with this, and of course we've been comfortable with it for years, but as the apostle will tell us later, I don't find it tedious to remind you of these things. I don't find it tedious at all. And so we're grateful for that. So we're in good company with the Apostle Paul here, reminding one another of undeserved favor that is only found through the finished work of Christ. We don't find it tedious to remind one another of that fact. It's a good thing. That's why the Lord's asked us to come join one another. So we can edify one another. We can build one another up. Are you getting built up out these doors out here? I don't think so. Unless somebody wants something from you. <laughs> His provision. 
is received by the finished work of Jesus Christ. Once we've received, we, you and I, as born-again believers, once we've received the finished work of Christ, we quickly become acquainted with new words in our lives. Some of those words, well, foreknowledge, atonement, propitiation, that's a big one, isn't it? Justification, adoption, Redemption, glorification, eternal life. These are words we become acquainted with as born-again believers. And what a joy. So the apostle here, in writing to the Gentile church of Rome, the apostle is rejoicing with the Gentile church. Can't you imagine Paul just going, man, this is great. This is something. So the fanfare, as we saw as Pastor Jim and myself were teaching chapter 8 the last couple of weeks, the fanfare of chapter 8 simply is, we're reminded, there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ who, don't, who do not walk in the flesh. We realize that we can be in Jesus, but we also realize that we can walk in the flesh likewise. That's where we get mixed up, isn't it? That's when we begin to start justifying our activities. It's always a favorite of, of myself and, and some of the elders and pastors when someone comes and says, oh, hey, this is my girlfriend. Well, we're living together. We're have, having physical relationships, but, you know, God understands. Oh, man, that's where we're getting ourselves into trouble. He understands, all right. He created you. But we've got to be careful. And so there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ as long as we're not walking in the flesh. And that's when we find ourselves on a slippery slope. But nonetheless, we just repent and we allow God to refresh us and renew us and give us a second chance. Praise the Lord. Now, the companionship we saw last time of God, the Holy Spirit, is ever present in our lives. The companionship is personal. And we were reminded of that. And we received that. I got so many comments about, man, thank you for reminding me of God, the Holy Spirit. And that's a good thing. So again, we don't find ourselves, it's not tedious to remind ourselves of these things. It's great. It's wonderful. It's marvelous. So the companionship of God, the Holy Spirit, is ever present. Tap into that reality. And I know that we are. And Continuing in chapter 8 as the reminder, we were reminded that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things. Every experience that you and I have had works together to bring glory to God. So we were reminded last time we don't have to be shameful. We don't have to live under guilt. We know that God allowed many things and has used many things, all things, together for the good. That doesn't mean that there weren't some painful things in our past. That doesn't mean there were some activities that we engaged in that we're not feeling good about, but we just give it back to the Lord. Lord, here's my shame and here's my guilt. And the Lord says, fair enough. I'll take it. I will take it. Praise the Lord. Lastly, the grand finale in Romans chapter 8, which is really the, the peak of the book of Romans chapter 8, the grand finale, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Comforting, isn't it? Marvelous. So through chapters 1 through 8, Paul has confirmed the elementary realities of Christianity. The elementary realities of Christianity. Now, the Roman church is solid in their relationship with Jesus. These Roman Gentiles are born-again believers, as confirmed by God the Holy Spirit. Wonderful. Furthermore, and as established, Paul has been writing primarily to a well-grounded church. Interesting. Certainly Paul would have had to have wondered eventually, why am I addressing this group of believers? I mean, we remember the Apostle Paul. He was the guy that planted churches. He was the guy that broke ground by the Holy Spirit. He was the guy that 
brought the name of Jesus to people that didn't ever hear that before. But now he's not even ever been to Rome yet. And he's writing this letter in, under obedience to God the Holy Spirit. Paul, I want you to write this letter. Oh, great, Lord, who's it to? Well, it's to a well-established, well-grounded church. I believe that Paul would, was saying in his heart, why would I do that? I'm the one that plants church, churches. These guys, and we already established, you know, Holy Spirit has already established this church. And so I have to think to myself, well, Paul must have been wondering, why am I doing that? But interestingly, and most importantly, Paul was obedient to that. It didn't make any sense to him. He's the guy that breaks ground. But now he's writing this letter, and he must be thinking, well, gee, I hope I'm not building on another man's foundation, as expressed previously in some of his writings. But, but again, he's being obedient because God and the Holy Spirit is saying, no, Paul, put your pen to paper and continue on. But again, his human heart has to be asking, why am I doing this? This is very odd to me, but I will obediently take care of the business at hand. Why am I addressing this solid group of believers? Then it hit him. It hit him. God was going to use the Gentile church to preach the gospel, the good news, to the nation that had rejected their own Messiah. Ding, Paul got it. So in the first eight chapters, Paul is making sure that all the elementary things are in place. And he knew that they were, but he wanted to give a written record to the eldership so in case they needed to reference something, they could say, oh, pull out the letter from Paul and we'll make sure we're on the right track. Oh, we know that we are, but it's nice to have something. That's why we have our Bible, right? It's nice to say, oh, I, I know the word and everything and I know God leads me, but I want to confirm it. And that's what the Romans were getting that privilege. Oh, I'm not quite sure. Well, let's pull the letter of of Rome, to us, us, the Roman church, let's see what Paul had to say about that. Oh, yeah, right here. Paragraph 10, the third sentence in. Oh, that's right. And so Paul is beginning to realize, I get it now. How many times have you and I been in a circumstance where we're just thinking, I don't get this? We've all been there. Let's face it. We've all been there, but we've obediently followed the leading of God the Holy Spirit. So that's a good thing, but there were times where we're kind of thinking, why? And then if we're fortunate enough, and not all the time it happens, and it won't all the time happen in this life, but sometimes the Lord shows us through a period of time, this is why I allowed this. This is why I asked you. Not all the time that happens, but when it does, that's when we do sing, we break out in, oh, happy day, right? But not all the time that is the case. But in this particular circumstance, Paul got it. Lord, you're going to use the Gentile church to preach the good news to your chosen people. And the Holy Spirit is just standing up saying, standing O, Paul, standing O. You obediently followed me and you didn't know. You walked by faith and now I'm showing you. And Paul just went, yeah. Yeah. Now we have chapter 9. Paul, with great joy, in verse 1 of chapter 9, writes and continues to write in his letter. He says, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Remember several weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago, we talked about the conscience. And those that are sensitive to the Lord listen to their conscience. Those who hate God drown out their conscience. And so Paul is saying, my conscience and the Holy Spirit are one. God is speaking in his still, small voice, and I'm hearing it. And so my conscience bearing witness in the Holy Spirit, I tell you that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. This is the apostle writing. I have great sorrow, wow, and continuous grief, not just a passing thing, 
Thank God the flu season is a passing thing. Thank God our colds are passing. But Paul is saying, oh no, but I have a continuous grief in my heart. And Paul is proclaiming it's not going away. Uh Uh-uh. It is not, this continual grief in my heart is not going away. And so that sparks our curiosity. Well, what could it be? My word. Verse 3, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. So Paul is proclaiming, speaking to you and I as the Gentile church, I I wish if I could be a curse from Christ, I wish I could take the place of my countrymen. Lord, take me, but save the nation of Israel. Now fascinating, just moments ago, once again in chapter 8, Paul just finished proclaiming, as I reminded us, Paul proclaimed in chapter 8, that nothing shall separate us from Christ. Nothing. So how is it that Paul could stand up and say, hey, Lord, take me, but leave, but save the nation of Israel? Well, Paul had a heart just like Moses, didn't he? We remember Moses in Exodus chapter 32. Now Moses is making his way down from the mount. He's been hanging out with the Lord. And then the Lord brought to Moses' attention, oh, your congregation is in serious sin, serious idolatry. They are engaged with a golden calf, thanks to high priest Aaron. Can you imagine Moses' horror? Can you imagine? I mean, he must have just flipped. What? And Moses is just begging God, Lord God, please forgive their sin. Please. But Moses knows the severity of this. And then Moses goes on in Exodus 32, 32, if not, if you won't forgive their sin, Lord, if not, blot me out. Take me as the ransom, Lord. Save the congregation, but take me. I pray you, blot me out of the book which you have written. Lord, take me, save the nation of Israel. Paul's love is exactly where Moses' heart was. Paul is saying, take me. Take me. Paul's love for his brethren was deep. Can we take a second and consider something? We talk a lot in the church conversation about the thorn in the flesh of Paul, and we suggest, oh, his eyes were goofy, or his face was rearranged, or his back was bowed. Is it quite possible that this thorn in the flesh given by Satan himself might have been Satan whispering to Paul, hey, Paul, your your countrymen are all going to hell. Could that have been the thorn in the the flesh? It would appear that it quite possibly could. Paul is saying, Lord, take me. Save my countrymen. But I know they're on the wrong track. Take me, Lord. Save your chosen people. Your chosen people, Lord, will not be replaced. Save them. And that's Paul's heart. Is that his thorn? Hey, I leave it to your consideration. Referring back to verse 3, referring to the nation of Israel, Paul is explaining these are my countrymen according to the flesh. According to the flesh. We were born... As family members, they're my countrymen. They are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory. To the Israelites pertain the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. So Paul has listed several things here. We'll draw your attention to the PowerPoint. But the nation of Israel, through adoption, through God's choice, the nation of Israel is clearly being shown as God's chosen. Number one, again, through the adoption. Well, when you get adopted, you're part of the family. That's it. Anybody get unadopted? I've never heard of such a thing. Now, you might have a falling out or whatever in your human family. I get it. 
But when you're adopted by God, the nation of Israel was adopted by God, therefore the glory followed. Remember the times of King Solomon? Man, people knew who Yahweh was when Solomon was reigning. Oh, they knew, people knew who, who, who Yahweh was when David was reigning and Joshua and such. But the glory of the temple, that was the house of God. This is just a building we just meet as a convenience. Don't misunderstand. This is not the house of God. This is a place where we meet as Christians. Yes, it's convenient. But the temple that was originally built, that was the house of God. This is just a convenience. We started out meeting in a living room. We outgrew the living room, so we got another building. Outgrew that building eventually, and now we're here. So this is where we gather. And so the glory in the days of Solomon, the covenants were given to the nation of Israel through the adoption. The giving of the law was given to the nation of Israel through the adoption. The privilege of serving God was given to the nation of Israel through the adoption. And then finally, the promises of God. Why, were all the, why was this package delivered to the nation of Israel? It was so that the nation of Israel would rejoice and say, hey, I want you to partake with us. We're God's chosen people, oh yes, but the door is wide open. Won't you come in and join us? And we'll qualify all these things as the weeks go on, as the Lord tarries. But that was the whole function of the nation of Israel. God had to choose a group, and he chose Israel. Because that's who he wanted to choose. And so he set Jerusalem in his blessed city of Jerusalem. And the Jews were the ones that were supposed to go out and represent the Lord. Very cool. Paul here has made a perfect case that Israel is God's chosen. Perfect. It's airtight, ironclad. Israel is God's choice. Now, to the nation of Israel, verse 5, speaking of the nation of Israel, verse 5, of whom from Israel the fathers... Who are the fathers? Well, we recognize them quite simply as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, to our fathers, Paul writing, and from whom, according to the flesh, this is the line where Christ came from. We qualify that quite simply in the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, and when you get a chance this afternoon or sometime during the week, review Matthew chapter 1. We will see the genealogy of Jesus Christ given in the gospel of Matthew chapter 1. And we'll see quickly, once we review the book of the gospel of Matthew, Matthew, it begins with Abraham in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, followed by Isaac and then Jacob. Praise the Lord. So Paul is saying, hey, according to the flesh, according to our forefathers, Christ came. Again, Paul is writing to the Gentile church, reminding of these elementary realities of Christianity. And so according to the flesh, Christ came, as we conclude our thought, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Is there a problem with that? The eternally God, blessed God, Jesus Christ himself? We don't have a problem with that, do we? Because it's written right here in pretty plain English, right? I don't care what your translation is. It's telling us that Jesus Christ is God, isn't it? So why is it so confusing to some of our friends that come and visit us in the neighborhood? Why is that? Well, I'll tell you, we've got to be very careful what kind of conversation we entertain with these folks. Because their mission is not to come, oh, hey, I believe that Jesus is God. Can I sit down and have a coffee and we'll have a conversation about it? That's not their mission. Folks' mission that knocks on your door that rejects Jesus as God wants to stumble you. You need to be very careful how you entertain these folks. And I'm not saying be rude or crude or anything like that, but be very discerning. You better be checked out in your elementary Christianity, which sometimes that can be challenged to some of us here in this room. That's okay, but I'm just saying, be very careful who and how you entertain. 
The first thing that needs to be asked when someone knocks on your door, you need to just ask them up front and, and actually let them know, this household believes that Jesus Christ is God. Do you believe that? Do you share? Do we have a commonality in that? And if it's either, the answer is either yes or it's no. It's not like, well, I'll have to tell you. Failed. You walk up to me and you say to me, I believe Jesus Christ is God. Do you believe that? I'm just going to say yes. I'm not going to give you a paragraph. I'm going to say yes. Now we have common ground, don't we? So be very careful when you hear that door knocking. Don't think that you're obligated. Some people, some people are obligated. Don't misunderstand. But in general, we need to be very cautious. And so we can end any kind of confusion by saying, this is what we believe. Jesus Christ is God. Do you agree? And if they say no, we just say, you know what? I am super busy. I would pray that you would read your scriptures, get out of your magazines, and ask the Lord God to reveal himself. Something along that line. But be very careful, again, spending time with that kind of attitude. They're not there to be your friend. They are not there to be your friend. God's selection of the nation of Israel through our first five verses of chapter 9 is absolutely evident. God selected the nation of Israel to be his chosen people. With this selection, and any selection for God's design, with selection comes stewardship. Stewardship, in other words, responsibility. So responsibility was given to Israel, but sadly, in a general comment, Israel rejected God's design for the nation of Israel. That's a general statement. That's a reality, obviously backed up by Scripture. Yet as Paul was writing to the church of Rome, it was being revealed to him that the Gentile church would be used by God to woo his chosen people back into the flock. Did you get that? Paul was, being, was coming to the realization that the Gentile church would woo. God wanted to use the Gentile church to woo the nation of Israel back into the fold. That's an amazing commission for us. God wasn't saying, oh, Paul, I want the Gentile church to replace my chosen people. I've given up on them. Nowhere can you find that in Scripture. Nowhere. And it begins with Moses. God is not done with the nation of Israel. God has barely begun because through, again, through the Gentile church, we don't become Jews. Don't misunderstand. We are born again, Jesus-loving Christians that have been commissioned to call Israel back. And that's the bottom line. That's the function of the Gentile church. There's no replacement. There's no, oh, Gentile church, please become Jews. We're going to see that in the book of Hebrews. When we finish the book of Romans, we're going to go directly into the book of Hebrews. All these things are qualified, and that's why you miss a day at Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley, you miss a lot. But thank God for the website. You miss something, man, just pull up Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley, dot com. And review. It's all there. It's all archived. Because this has been some misunderstood thinking in the modern day church. And when something is misunderstood, then guess what? It becomes misrepresented. Misrepresented. And we as the Gentile church have misrepresented a lot of things concerning the nation of Israel. So Lord, forgive us and now get us on the, right back on the right track. But we're not to, again, we are not to become Jews. We are new wine in new skins. And we praise the Lord as the Spirit of God leads us. And we're grateful. No more rituals, no more traditions, no more of those things that were designed just to point to God but became perverted over a period of time, a very short period of time for that matter. 
And so now we have the freedom in Christ for whom the Son has set free is free indeed. We're free from those kinds of things. And that is to irritate our Jewish friends. Hey, you can't do that. Why not? Tell me why. Tell me what Jesus said that gave you that opinion to our Jewish friends. Show me. Well, they can't. And that's irritating. And that irritation is to design a jealousy. And that jealousy is to actually put down the nonsense, come with an open heart as you and I did to Jesus Christ. Say, Jesus, take me. I'm yours. And that's what this church is all about today, the modern day church. We're not replacing anybody. We're not booting anybody out. We're not elbowing our way into what's rightfully Israel's. We're desiring Israel to come to repentance. Praise the Lord. How exciting is that? Very exciting. I could ask the worship team to come join me. As we've looked at chapter 9, the first five verses of Romans this day, make no mistake, God is by no means done with Israel. No means, he, by no means is he done. As Romans chapters 9 through 11 unfold, read ahead, but as Romans chapters 9 through 11 unfold, we, the Gentile church, will see our calling. Not only will we see it, but we'll see it with great clarity. By the time we get done with Romans 9 through 11, we are going to be refreshed and renewed with a love for God's chosen people. As we, as the Gentile church, see and receive our calling, we will become better equipped to follow the Apostle Paul as he follows Christ into a deeper love and prayer commitment for the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. So as you come before the Lord this week, as you already have, continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to reveal himself in a wonderful way. Why? Because our God, Jesus Christ, the second of a triune God, our God, Jesus Christ, he is greater than all. And so, Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for setting the table. We've only just begun. Your perfect word, Father God, the clarity, the love that you have for your chosen nation. Give us the ability, as you have given us the commission to be used by you, that you will woo your people back into your presence. Father God, give us the ability to carry out that commission, not by our might, not by our power, but Holy Spirit, by you and only you, as you, Holy Spirit, point to Jesus Christ and his finished work. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God and Lord God bless Israel and use Calvary Chapel Harupa Valley as you see fit to glorify your name as you call your nation back into your presence into that personal relationship through Jesus Christ the only way to the Father the grace the finished work God you are great Amen join us by standing if you need prayer, come up front. We will be meeting right after. But as we go out shouting to the Lord, let's remember that our God is greater. Water you turn into wine.